Okay, good evening everyone. Uh, thanks for coming to our first uh, Young Members Group event. Um, we set up this group to, I guess, kind of help create a network amongst young engineers and I suppose to help bridge the gap from university to uh, actually working in the workplace. So we're quite fluid in what we um, are planning on doing with our events. But this first one here is uh, basically the road to chartership and it was kindly given by uh, Kieran Rowan here, a director in RPS, and Roger Tagert, our director of Cronin and Sutton. Um, so, as I said, myself, Mairead and Dara, who are in the front row here, uh, we're part of this Young Members Committee, so if you have any questions afterwards or any suggestions for future events, uh, just ask one of us and we'll be delighted to help you. Uh, thanks again. Okay, guys, welcome. We intend this to be quite a, an informal session, really. Um, so if you have any questions when we're talking, uh, by all means, raise your hand and we can have a chat. Or if you have any questions afterwards, uh, you can open to the floor or come down and meet us personally and we'll be happy to, to give you a steer and things, you know. Um, so essentially what we're going to do is we're just going to give some probably some personal thoughts on the chartership process with the Ice and uh, just drawing on bits of experience over the years. And obviously it's quite, can be quite a daunting process, particularly the Ice because it's got a fairly uh, formidable exam involved in it, let's say. Um, but to think of it from step A to step B, uh, it, you know, you can lessen the, 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 the fear of that exam, I think, by just working your way through it and getting prepared for it and whatnot. Now, the, the qualification itself, you know, the, the ice hockey uses this kind of logo, uh, the international passport, to, uh, to practice. And that actually is what it is, because you find when you travel Ireland, UK, Europe, and uh, uh, CNGM ice is on your business card, people do recognise it as a, as a, a standard bearing for a, a high-quality structure engineer, hopefully, let's say, you know. And ice hockey is members across 105 countries, and in certain countries uh, like Ireland, UK, and whatnot, and also including certain parts of Canada, the qualification itself is seen as the professional engineering standard. You know, so for example, in if you're working in British Columbia, Vancouver, let's say, uh, and you're qualified in ice hockey, um, you're straight away equal to a, a professional engineer status, and there's a mutual agreement there. So I suppose. Some of the reasons why the the, the, the ice hockey or the CN ice hockey is so popular is because it's a very rigorous standard. Uh, there's two broad parts to it. There's your initial professional development, uh, which I'd say a lot of the young faces in the room will be at that kind of stage now, uh, where you're kind of building your experience, maybe over four to five years, and you're uh, satisfying core objectives set up by the institute. And, and Roger will go into those in more detail uh, in the second half of the lecture. And then there's the formal examination. The formal examination, as you may know, is a seven-hour exam. Uh, generally, you, can, you know, a variety of questions, and you draw on one question uh, depending on your experience. So, the purpose of tonight's lecture really is uh, just to clearly explain the process and uh, kind of demystify it because it can be a bit daunting when you download the uh, the, the, the various manuals from the I Strucky website. It looks like quite a complicated procedure uh, to go from graduate engineer to uh, chartered engineer. Um, so, we like to try and demystify that, and also at the end of the, the evening. Um, you, you'll get some contacts just from members of the existing committee who will be able to guide you along the process if you want to drop an email or give us a phone uh, in, the, in the months ahead, uh, by all means, please do so. It can be a daunting process. Uh, people get a bit hung up on, on the fact that the exam has got uh, this low pass rate. Um, but it's just worth noting, in, in Ireland, in the Republic of Ireland branch, uh, generally speaking, about 60% of applicants who, who attempt the exam pass the exam. And that would be, you know, one of the higher percentages from across the world. You know, to pass the exam, you need experience and you need preparation. And I personally feel that one of the reasons that the pass, the, the let's say, the failure rate is kind of high across the world is that people maybe rush into it, uh, you know, with with the with the minimum four to five years experience, when perhaps it needs a bit more experience than that. And also, perhaps having prepared well enough for it. The best intention in the world, uh, when you apply for the exam and you're going to set aside whatever, how many months to get ready for it, um, you know, your working life is going to intervene and your personal life is going to intervene and it can be quite difficult. Uh, so it might be not, not, maybe not for want of intent, but just things intervening to, to sway your preparations. Um, so on the experience side of things, uh, the I Strucky would recommend that you spend four to five years uh, post-graduation gaining the relevant experience. And uh, that's the initial profes professional development phase. Uh, and then you, once you uh, present your portfolio of work uh, to the local associa association members, do a, a one hour long interview, uh, you need to pass, pass that stage, hopefully pass that stage, and go on then to be uh, eligible to take the exam. And the exam, as you know, is a seven hour design exam. 
Uh, it's often compared to say squeezing one week's work into uh, into seven hours, uh, and you do need to have a fair body of experience behind you for that, and experience needs to be quite relevant. Uh, so you probably need to be doing a lot of number crunching in, in your in your IPD years, uh, such that you can you know develop two very distinct solutions to a to a structural problem, uh, and the word distinct there is quite important because. Uh, the solutions do have to be kind of different structural systems, and you have to draw on a very a vast range of skills, uh, not just communication, letter writing, whatnot, but also be expected that you have a, a, a decent knowledge of ge geotechnical engineering uh, and geotechnical design as well, uh, and all these things take a, a fair bit of uh, time to, uh, to 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 gain experience. And I often draw, even just from my own personal experience, I did the bridge question, and um, uh, you know when, when you're preparing for the exam, you're kind of looking at all the, the the various questions that come, come up, and uh, it, it never kind of dawned on me that a, an opening bridge would pop up. But in the year that I did exam, this opening bridge popped up, and it just so happened that, again, just illustrating the, the experience part of it, uh, I'd say for the first time in about 20 years, we had an opening bridge in the office the previous six months. And uh, again, it was that level of experience that you need to have behind you that gets you through the tough days when you, when you get a, uh, maybe a left field kind of question uh, that, can, that kind of can appear in the exam, right? And then the preparation part of it, uh, the lack of preparation, I guess it's not from, not from, not from want of uh, intent, but it generally speaking is because we all know what it's like to work as, uh, as, uh, as graduate engineers, civil engineers, structural engineers. Uh, generally, if you're, if you're in practice, you know, it's quite demanding. There can be late, late, late nights working. Uh, so it can be hard to squeeze in the time to, to get ready for the exam. And also, you know, you've got to have pretty understanding boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives, that type of thing as well, just to allow you the space to get ready for this, uh, this particular exam, right? Uh, now the preparation, I'm kind of skipping forward a bit, uh, just when you get to go ahead to do the exam, you are probably talking about blocking off the six months leading up to that exam uh, and spending a lot of time just getting ready for it. And what a lot of people do, and this is the way I approach it as well, is that you spend a bit of time getting your Libre Arch folder ready because mm -hmm. it is an open book exam. Uh, the temptation is there to bring a lot of uh, gear into the exam with you. And that can be kind of uh, maybe uh, counterproductive in some respects. Uh, so you'd like to have a kind of a Libre Arch folder just with you know, simple design solutions or uh, quick aid memoirs, that type of thing. Uh, <coughs> and once you gather that over, to over time, it's really a question then of just you know, tackling questions. You might t take a random question and give yourself a few weeks to do it over time. Uh, and when you've de developed your solutions, uh, talk to your colleagues in the office or give anybody in the committee a ring here and they'll be happy to, to give you a bit of a hand with it. And over time, as you get closer to the exam, it's you know, starting to do the papers maybe with a 10 hour time limit and then down to a seven hour time limit. So you're just constantly uh, gearing up for the exam, almost like a, a sporting event that you're, you're gearing up for it. Because uh, seven hours is quite a demanding uh, mental effort uh, to get through, so you do need to do the, the bit of training. And generally speaking, it, you do require that kind of six months leading up to the exam to, uh, to hand over maybe every second weekend or thereabouts, and every weekend leading up to it, perhaps. The routes to membership, um, this is obviously from the ice uh, details themselves, like, but you're presumably you've all done this is a complete educational base and in Ireland uh, we have we are basically eligible straight away once we've done, we've done our four year degrees uh, or B N honours degree uh, that's the educational base completed and there's a note there even that you know, from my rookie that a degree from an EU member state that couldn't do B N honours gives you the initial step into the, into the process and then you're into uh, initial professional development and uh, Roger will lay out in more detail what's required here but 12, 13 core objectives that from the moment you start working really you want to be keeping a diary and uh, focusing on those core objectives and then maybe when three to four to five years pass uh, you're looking at gathering together a, bit of a portfolio of projects that you've worked on and then submitting that to the uh, uh, with your core objectives and your demonstration how they've been achieved and then basically attending an interview a bit like it's very similar to the IEI chartership interview uh, with two or three uh, say chartered engineers who just run through the portfolio with you and give you kind of a uh, a gentle quizzing on it, uh, and then assuming you pass that, then you're eligible then to enter the exam. Mm -hmm. uh, generally, the following year or the following year or two, whatever suits your own yourself. Now, in Ireland, uh, a lot of people would do, would take it this way because because the ICE Rookie has a mutual uh, recognition agreement uh, with Engineers Ireland. Uh, what people in Ireland would typically do is just you know, or instead of four or five years after graduating, uh, they would undertake the, the Chartered Engineer uh, Engineers Ireland status. And once you achieve that, first of all, it allows you to call yourself a charter engineer straight away, but also gives you a buy-in straight into applying for the exam. Uh, so you can kind of bypass the formal kind of uh, 
core objectives of the, of the ice jockey, which are very similar obviously to the EII in any case. In terms of IPD, if you, if you do want to follow that route and you want to go straight through the ice jockey process, uh, the initial professional development, you know, the ice jockey kind of talks about three types of IPD. You could have individually managed IPD, and this is where you basically, uh, you're in an office, you're keeping a diary, you're doing quarterly reports yourself, and uh, you're following those away, and all the time you're kind of achieving the core objectives which have been laid out. There is, if you're lucky enough to be in an office which has an accredited training scheme with the ICE or other, other institutions, you can follow that, and once you've been signed off on that scheme, you can go straight to the, uh, uh, into the PRI status as well. But the most common one that we tend to use is this one here, the, the retrospectively collated route. And that is that when you've got your three to four to five years experience, that you gather together your portfolio of experience uh, <coughs> using the guidelines which are on the ice jockey website, and then you submit it to the local committee, or local uh, committee through the ice jockey headquarters, uh, who review it and undertake an interview with you, you know? And that's probably the, the most standard way that people would, would, would tackle it uh, in Ireland, let's say, you know? And then the interview itself, um, you know, there are form application forms that you use from the Ice website. Again, if you find any of those confusing, the local committee will be very happy to, to help you fill them in and give you, you know, if you need witnesses from fellows and that type of thing, no, no particular issue there. Um, but you're just, you're writing a report that demonstrates that you've achieved the 12, 13 objectives uh, that the Ice requires you to fulfill. And then the interview set schedule, generally speaking, you're applying for that around about the 1st of September uh, each year uh, with a view that the PRI interview will be held November, December time um, in whatever city, Dublin, Belfast, London, wherever, whatever city. And if you pass that then uh, you can go forward and do the exam the following year, although a lot of people will wait another year and do the following year after that. Uh, and that's generally uh, just a quick overview of, of the process. I might hand over to Roger now as he will take you through the, the core objectives. Hopefully, all you guys are student members. It's free, so you should be student members of the institution. Um, it's the first step on the road to chartership, um, and you should avail of it. Um, I mean, it's obviously great value for mon money in that it's a, it is actually free. Um, chartership is, is, in some ways, is, is maybe the high point of your career. It's certainly a, a gold standard, uh, and all structural engineers should, should aim to be chartered. Um, it it, cert, it sets a, a certain it, it sets a bar effectively and, and lets lets other people know that you've reached a certain level of competency uh, and expertise uh, and it's extremely important you you focus on it and, and it's it's a goal a, a career goal it should be your, your most important career goal in your first five years um, this is what the the uh, the institution um, explains uh, how uh, or what chartered members uh, should be able to do. Um, I suppose it's, it's a definition of what a chartered member is. I mean, I would add to that that uh, effectively you become an expert problem solver. Uh, you become very good at communication, management, and you've got to be ambitious as well. Um, you find that um, the Becoming a chartered member, um, a chartered engineer, doesn't doesn't simply happen. It's something you've got to you've got to work towards, um, and you've got to think about how you're going to get there. It it is effectively it's your career, um, and you've got to plan it out. Um, some of you may uh, work for consultancies that have mentorship programs, uh, maybe even uh, accredited training. Um, notwithstanding that, you spend a large part of your day working uh, on yourself. You know, working. On your own, um, and you need to look back uh, on what you're doing on, on a weekly or monthly basis to see that you're you're progressing in the right direction, and that in three or four years you're going to have the, the required experience. As Karen has already outlined, there are uh, I suppose there are there are three areas or, or three stages to becoming a chartered engineer. Obviously, your your academic qualification in the first instance. Um, and then your professional development, followed by your interview and your your examination. Um, and you can't really take, particularly the professional development and the examination, you can't really take them uh, as, as complete separate entities. Uh, the exam is a seven hour exam, um, but having said that, if you have 
if you've been uh, orientated towards achieving that over your three or four years, the exam should be really should be a doddle to you. Um, and I say that because uh, you develop uh, and gain the experience you need uh, if you if you go out there and you, you want if you want to pass the exam um, and you're determined to do that and you keep an eye on what you're doing day to day and the type of work you're being assigned in your consultancies and the type of projects you, you get to do uh, and you're a little bit demanding about uh, the type of work you do over that period of three or four years, the exam will be easy at the end. You'll have so much experience. Um, I think Kieran said that the success rate for, for Irish uh, engineers sitting in the exam is about 60% and the reason for that is because um, you get a, a, a much broader um, range of experience working with an Irish consultancy than you might necessarily do working for a big consultancy in the US or, or in the UK um, and you get to do a, a, a far more varied uh, workload and uh, a more varied level of experience which will should make the exam uh, a foregone conclusion. Everybody has bad exams and bad days, um, but believe me, it's 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 about being determined to get there. Uh, and it's you know whether you pass or fail the exam is really is is not the seven hours you do um, in in May or, or January or whatever the, the the exams are going to be set. It, it really is how much work you do in the four years up to that. So the institution. Um, I suppose the exam, the interview, and the professional exam are, are designed to sort of um, to to assess your your suitability and your performance in three areas: um, personal engineering, which is which is technical, and then management and, and commercial. And to be, I suppose, to uphold the standards of the institution, you've got to be competent in all those three areas. And I'll, I'll go through those in a little little bit of detail. There are minimum standards that they want you to achieve in each of these um, and this is uh, I suppose this is relevant both to your professional development um, and to uh, to the exam but I suppose it, it, it applies to your career thereafter as well I mean to be honest the exam is is, is really only a, it, it makes you a chartered engineer and it gives you that, that official title but your career development goes on from there and the, the, I suppose the, the values you learn um, in, in achieving chartership you'll take through with you for the, the rest of your career These are the, the, the basic standards, uh, which are uh, effectively you, whether or not you have an appreciation for a subject, um, a certain amount of knowledge about it, experience in having done it, or uh, you demonstrate a, an ability. And you'll see these are these are minimum standards applied to each particular core objective. So these are the core objectives, and these are the type of things you should be keeping an eye on. I mean. Whether or not, whatever route you take to chartership, whether you're uh, you're going to mentor yourself or whether there's an in-house course. I mean, obviously, uh, you know, we'd like to see people do the uh, the institution's preparation course here uh, in advance of the exam. But leading up to that, um, you should be you should be looking at what you're doing day to day, month to month, um, and how uh, uh, how you're trying to achieve these objectives. So. These the, the objectives. I mean, the, these are the personal ones that, that relate to, uh, I, I suppose, yourself personally as as an engineer. Um, you've got to know something about the the institution um, you want to become a chartered member of. I mean, that that's self evident. You've got to have some involvement. Um, you've got to be able to go to meetings. You've got to uh, you know, uh, you've got to keep up with your your CPD. Um, and you've got, to, you've got to know something about it, and, and you may well be asked uh, about that at, at your interview. I mean, have you have you gone to into uh, to uh, uh, lectures? Have you had any involvement? Are you involved with the uh, the student uh, end of the uh, the institution? You, you have to have some involvement. So it's as well to get involved in it early enough. Um, this is, I mean, along with. Technical ability, I think communication is is probably the it's one of your key your core values as, as an engineer, um, and it's something. I mean, uh, we're talking about communication on drawings and calculations verbally via IT. Uh, you know, you can have the fan greatest ideas and you can be the, the the most technically gifted problem solver, but if you can't communicate um, and communicate effectively, um, and not just to your fellow engineers to 
to um, non-professionals, design team members, clients, and you you need to you need to think about that day to day, and it's something that you develop with experience. And young engineers often find it quite difficult to to. I mean, they're, they're having enough trouble, um, I suppose, getting their head around what they're trying to do, uh, and you know, being able to communicate it onto a third party can be quite difficult. Communicate it effectively. That becomes obviously far more important uh, when you work with a consultant um, in a consultancy because how you communicate with, with particularly clients or architects uh, can have a big impact on the job. So you should, you know, there are there are certain key things here with respect to how you, you demonstrate um, uh, as part of your, your, um, your portfolio of experience that you're going to build up over three years uh, about how you, you can demonstrate an ability to, uh, to communicate. Um, and these, these slides are all downloadable from the, the institution's website anyway, so I, I, I won't labour on them. But obviously, uh, you've got to show an interest in, in, in writing letters. You've, you've got to take an interest in, in letters that are written in the office and, and how they're written and how they're phrased um, and how, how ideas are communicated. As graduate engineers, the communicating you, you probably do most frequently is, is with your own calculations um, and drawings and communicating with draftsmen in the office. And you should, you should, you know, you should dwell on that and, and think about um, if somebody picks something up you've done, you know, is, is it legible? Is it, uh, does it express the intent uh, of, of what you are trying to do? Because um, if you don't practice that over the, uh, the, the three or four years before you sit the exam, uh, your exam, that's, I mean, you, often people fail these exams because they simply can't communicate. Uh, they can't communicate effectively what it is that they're trying to do, uh, the schemes they're trying to develop, the calculations they're trying to do. You obviously got to uh, be able to, to conceptualize um, uh, your, your engineering designs, um, and that is, is, is effectively taking it. In some cases, it could be taking a client's brief, it could be an architect's brief, it could be the brief from your, your director in your office who's, who's asking you to do a certain thing. Um, and it, it may be so much that you, you, know, you need clarification. You shouldn't be afraid to ask for clarification because if you start off, obviously, and you're not clear what it is you're supposed to be doing, you're, you're never going to deliver uh, the product at the, at the very end. Um, you've got to be able to demonstrate as part of your, your, uh, your professional development that you know instances where you've done this, um, and I'll talk about this later on about your your, uh, uh, your your there's a whole load of forms and stuff that uh, that the institution uh, provides that you should use uh, on a on a, uh, a quarterly or monthly basis to, to track your progress. Um, obviously, this is the one that I suppose graduate engineers and, and, and students are most familiar with, which is is. Um, is the ability to to analyze um, structural problems um, analyze and and determine stresses and strains and deflections and everything else that's probably the easiest thing and it's it's the one thing you do um, uh, you know you you spend four years in college leading up to that point and it, it should be second nature and um, you always learn um, and you always have to keep refreshing your, yourself on, on, on how you do things and why you do certain things uh, in, in the way you determine and, and analyze structures. I suppose the uh, one of the key things here is 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 the the ability to to think independently and to have confidence in your design. Um, and because you need to build on that confidence um, you know during those three or four years before you sit the exam. And uh, the way to do that is to be extremely thorough in, in what you do um, and to, to to practice and practice and practice over and above uh, necessarily what what your daily workload is. Uh, I mean, if, if if you are weak in particular areas, I mean, nobody comes out of college uh, even with a with a first class honours, um, and uh, you know could think that they, they know everything there is to know about engineering. Um, so you should take it on yourself to to you know progress your learning um, in your first couple of years as a consultancy. If you feel you have weaknesses, you talk to people. Um, you you know you do some background reading and research, um, so that you're you're fully competent in, in, in these that you can say you you know you've looked at these uh, these topics and you know something about them or at least you know where to go and find something else uh, about them if, if a particular problem comes up. Obviously, uh, you know in working in Irish consultancies, 
most people are going to get a, a, an introduction to steel, concrete, masonry, and timber. Uh, I mean, if you're working in, in maybe consultancies abroad, you might get stuck doing one thing or another. Um, but you need to have um, uh, at least a, a, a knowledge of the, the, the properties of the four main materials. Uh, and if you don't, even if you don't plan to answer, a, a, you know, an exam, an exam question on one of them, you should certainly know something about them. I mean, this isn't simply about sitting the exam at the end. Um, this is about developing as an engineer because you know that's what charter should is. It isn't just simply passing an exam uh, after four years. Um, obviously, the environmental aspect of what we do is 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 extremely important, um, and you need to know something about what it is you, uh, you know, what you do day to day and how it affects um, not just the environment of of a specific site, but uh, obviously uh, on a broader context as well um, and it, it should be part of your, your design philosophy uh, as you develop designs for particular projects, particular sites. Um, I mean we're, you know, we're not here to, to tear the, the, the earth uh, asunder uh, in, in, you know, in, in trying to put up a, a block of flats and, and sometimes just a little bit of uh, careful thought can make a, a, a bit of difference. Uh, you need to demonstrate anyway to, uh, uh, as part of your uh, development that you know that you have put some thought into this on various projects. Um, I mean, there are some fairly simple ones here. I mean, the, I mean, we're obviously in Dublin can be familiar enough with contaminated land, sustainability, um, methane and, and radon gas. You, you should obviously, if you don't know something about these, I mean, I, I would say uh, my advice would be that you you download these from the the website and you stick them on your desk in front of you and. You know, every three or four weeks you go back and you think, well, have I dealt with any of these? I mean, have I come, you know, are there any projects in the office? Can I get up and walk across to a senior engineer or somebody else and, and ask them, you know, what's his experience in these? Are we doing any projects in the office? It, it, as I said, it is your career and it really is up to you to, to go out there and to make sure that you're in a position to pass the exam. Uh, you just can't rock up after three years and, and, and hope to pass it uh, unless you've, uh, you've actually gone out of your way to make sure that you've obtained the, the relevant experience. Obviously you've got to have some experience of construction techniques. Um, I mean most people are going to site meetings uh, and will get some time on site even if it is a fortnightly um, you you know you just open your eyes on site. Uh, now I know there's not an awful lot of sites in Dublin um, so that's a lot more difficult than it used to be. But again, it, it you know, it may be a case that you have to ask someone, can you go out to site with them? If, if there's something interesting going on, you haven't seen it before, you put your hand up and say, look, I wouldn't mind going out and seeing this, you know, there's a, there's a, a pour going on, or there's a, a, there's a deep basement here, or there's temporary works or propping, I'd like to see that, can I go out? It doesn't necessarily need to be, you know, something you're, you're working directly on in the office. Um, the, um, well, these are just some of the construction topics. I mean, as I said, a lot of this is, is about um, it's about deciding what, what you want to do in those three years and making the most of it um, and going out there, looking at the work your office is doing um, and, uh, and trying to get familiar with all these uh, topics. As, as a chartered engineer, um, obviously you, you, you can't ignore both the management and commercial side of what we do, particularly in the, in the current environment. Um, fees are extremely tight and we need to be extremely efficient in, in what we do. Um, and you've got to demonstrate that you have uh, you've some experience in this, uh, or at least an understanding. Um, and, and, you know, we talk about leadership skills. I mean, um, you, leadership skills can apply to just simply uh, how you deal with, with draftsmen on a day-to-day -day basis and, and you know th they may be the only team or the only people you're actually in charge of or directing um, but you can you can think about how you communicate um, to, to those people who are doing drawing work for you um, and uh, the, the management skills I mean often for graduate engineers it's, it's self-management how you manage yourself how you manage your time um, how you manage your workload uh, how effectively do you do that um, and you know, do you, do you look at how you do it? I mean, do you quantify what you're doing day to day and, and think about it, other than just trying to get through your nine to five or nine to six? There are ways, obviously, of of, uh, 
of, of demonstrating your uh, that you have um, you've attained a, a certain level of competency going back to these the uh, the minimum standards um, and these are these are simple enough I mean attendance of products uh, at, at a project meeting ticks a box there that you've you've you know you've gone and you've looked at how a project is managed um, you've maybe spoken with the architect you know it, it, it goes back to communication as much as anything else and being involved in the process. Um, you've got to have a, an understanding of, of, of contractual and, uh, and legal matters associated with the, with the business you're involved in. Um, I mean, at graduate level, that might be uh, on the periphery, um, but you know, there's nothing stopping you at, at lunchtime, you know, reading up a little bit about PI insurance and, and how it affects what we do. Um, it, it, you know, as I said, the, the, the broader your, your, your experience and uh, the broader you make your experience over those three or four years, uh, the easier the exam will be. Uh, health and safety, uh, another one of the core objectives. Um, it, you know, it, it often falls to the, the, the junior engineer to write the uh, design risk assessment for a project anyway, which is good practice. Um, and if it isn't handed to you, you should put your hand up and say, well, I wouldn't mind writing it. At least I'll find out a little bit about um, the issues that affect uh, health and safety on site and, and how my design influences those. Um, you've got to be able to uh, show that you, 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 know, you have some knowledge of that. Um, this goes back to, uh, uh, this is, I mean, it's, uh, again, it's, this is another important one. I mean, as a junior engineer, you might not necessarily be involved in this day to day. Um, but you should have an interest and you should try and find out about how jobs are tendered and um, you know how the level of fees are set um, and how much the project is um, how much it costs to do in the office because at some point with probably little, very little introduction you'll be handed something to price um, and uh, you know it, it's pointless at that saying well look I know nothing about it I haven't paid attention I haven't asked a question in the past four years and um, you know we need to be even more efficient than we've ever been uh, as engineers, um, and how uh, you know the, the cost of a project, how, how much it costs to do that in the office is part of that, um, and how projects are, are how how they're run and how they how much they cost the client. I mean, clients are you know they're not really interested in, in you know in the size of the columns you're using or the depth of the beams, uh, other than the cost of those elements. Uh, architects obviously have, have different interests, but. You need to have a, an awareness of, of you know, the cost of the schemes you're putting together, um, you know, which is more expensive. And you need to do that. You need to read the, the latest journals. You need to see which materials are, are, are more expensive at the moment and, and what's, you know, what's common in, in the industry and you know, what projects have been built out of. Are hotels been built in steel? Are they been built in concrete? Why is that? And ask questions and, and develop a, an understanding. I mean, you know, most of you guys are, are probably working 40 hours, 45 hours a week. Um, you need to take a certain amount of that time as your own professional development and stand back from number crunching <coughs> um, and maybe marking up drawings and stuff and, and think about, well, what am I getting out of today? Have I learned something? You know, what have I learned this week? Uh, is it bringing me closer to the, uh, my, my chartership? Uh, and, and if it isn't, you should be asking why. Is, is it a failure on... Uh, the, the firm you're working with, or is it a failure that you're not interested enough? Contact documentation. Well, that's you know, um, you've got to know about uh, forms of contract um, and how jobs are procured uh, and the type of contracts we sign with different types of clients. Again, that's that's it's background reading, uh, particularly at uh, at junior engineer level. And there's a list of different types of contracts. I mean, you're, you're not going to know uh, about these in, in detail, and, and nor do you need to, um, other than, you know, you need to be able to know if, if someone says something at a meeting, uh, you know, you, at least you'll have an understanding, you won't have a blank look if somebody asks you a question. This is background reading that you should be doing on all the topics that you don't know anything about. You should know at least the quality system in your own office. Uh, I know they tend to be a bit of uh, a millstone in people's neck uh, at, time, uh, at times, and, and uh, you know, a lot of offices have them and, and don't necessarily em employ them day to day. But you should at least know, you know, what system your office is using um, and how you using it on a daily basis, and at least extract the bits of it that might necessarily be useful to you um, to help you with uh, 
uh, keep control of, of your work, the quality of your work uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. Oh, and that's the end of that. I really didn't mean to say that if anybody has any questions, you know, because we'll ask them if anybody has questions and nobody will have any. So um, if somebody wants to put, just jump right in. <coughs> Carol is there somewhere. Um, if anybody has any questions, it's easy. I mean, uh, the exam is easy. <laughs> should be nothing that anybody has any any uh, concern about at all you know it'll be a relief after your three or four years as, as young engineers previously um, there was, uh, there was uh, courses ran wasn't there leading up to exams and like yeah preparation, and, and the institution will be will be running those again this year and they, they are excellent they're, they're six weeks four or six weeks i think who are they uh, sorry there are two courses we're running um a graduate course starting in January, which I think is about 14 weeks long. Maybe you all just shot. Um, it's about two hours an evening or three hours an evening, and we're going to cover maybe concrete one day, um, old story buildings another day, and so on. It's actually, I went to it many years ago, and it's just fantastic. It's a bit of a refresher from everything you've learned in college. Yeah. Um, I'm organizing that, so I'll be in Sign up, yeah. 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 Uh, and, and there is a preparation course then as well in, in advance. Uh, the, the, the changes to the, the exams, uh, is that from this year, January of this year? Yeah. yeah. So, so you have two exams and, and the preparation course is in December, I think December we're talking about. December yeah. 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 So anybody doing it this year should, should definitely be signing up for it. It's extremely useful, um, along with you know, some exam preparation techniques. I mean, that's, that's the technical side of the exam, practice and dry runs and stuff like that. I mean, you're all used to sitting exams, so that should be no, um, you know, that, that should be no mystery to you. Oh, great question. Yeah, that's a good question. Sorry, thanks everyone. Yeah, I don't know. Well, <laughs> 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 they, they don't over the 20th, it's still on the website. That must be changed, you know. And oh, okay. We'll, we'll, we'll kind of I mean, maybe do a circular and yeah. to all the ideas yeah. attended on that, you know, because we need to do the same at lots of moments. So. Good point. Uh, what are the changes to the exam? Well, I might just start, start briefly that the, 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 the number of questions have been reduced. Um, so, for example, there was an offshore question, um, and it was found that there wasn't a great take up of that question. You know, that maybe one or two candidates a year took that question. I think it was one of the structural glass, it was a bigger, smaller niche topics. <laughs> uh, so, to reduce the number of questions, and rather than having the uh, exam once a year, which is run for the last Friday and Easter holidays at that time, uh, the exam is not going to be held in January and July, uh, starting in 2015. There are broadly the changes that the, the, the exam format would say the same. That is, 50 cents to marks going for, uh, you know, et cetera, development, <coughs> six solutions, that type of thing. And 50 cents to marks going out for the design development, uh, that, that type of thing. And also, it's really, th it's, it's a reduction number of questions and a double, double chance each year to, or two, two times each year to do the contract exam. So. There's a cap on there, how many times you can take the exam. There is, I think it's four, is that a real amount of years? Is it top of a punishment if you were to take four times? Was mm. it eight? Yeah. No, nobody yeah. should need more than one attempt. <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, if, if you're prepared for it, if, if you've done, if, if you downloaded that and you have the core objectives and you spend your time over three years, you have three years to prepare for it. You know? uh, it's enough time to prepare for any seven hour exam. I mean, you're, you're immersed in it day in, day out if you're working in a consultancy. So. It, it should be it should be very straightforward. If you go out and you get the required experience, uh, and if you do those things that the, the institution considers as core objectives, and it, it's up to you to, to, to get that experience. Uh, I made the point that it, we need experience and preparation. Once you mm. hit those two things, you know, uh, the big prize is not having to repeat the exam. And that's uh, the goal I had in my, my head when I tried to do the exam. As far as in fact, 12 months time, so repeat it would be a, a real course. You know? And I would probably concur with what Roger says. Um, the year coming up to it is all about practice, practice, practice. And just don't leave it too late because if I were to do it now, I wouldn't get it because I'm not sitting designing beams and scheming out every day. Um, and I was really in that zone when I did it, and that's probably the only reason I got it because you're just used to doing that every day. So pick your time and carefully. Don't wait until you know you're getting into management and you're not necessarily doing the maths anymore. Just be aware that you really need to get it out at about that stage. I think that sound about the situation. I haven't seen any of the questions or anything, but um, we put enough.
couple of events this Sunday, the kind of managerial side of things, and the project overview as a whole. Is that, is that accurate? The exam at all, or is it just literally one of the questions? No, it, no, it, it doesn't. I mean, there are sections in the uh, in questions where you have to write letters to clients to explain, you know, changes in the scheme. So I mean, they, they tend to be fairly technical. I mean, you're you're not asked to put in a fee bid for a, a change or anything like that. I mean, it's um, the the management side of it is, uh, you know, you want to come to. I, so I'm talking in, in a broader sense, not just about the exam. The exam is just one point on your road to being a chartered engineer. It's a, it's a test at the end, uh, as much for yourself as it is. It, well, it's, it's for the industry as a whole to say, look, this guy, we're going to call him chartered. He, he has reached a certain level of, of expertise. Um, now, the, the exam is, is, is very technical, you know. And in, in that respect, it's, it should be fairly straightforward, you know. I mean, three years is, it would be difficult enough to sit it, you know, a year out of college because you simply wouldn't have the required experience. But uh, after three years, you should do. I really admire your confidence. <laughs> I find it much harder. No, well, than well that. You, you have to be confident about it. It's, it's yeah. a goal. It's, a, it's an incredibly important career goal, and you set your sights on it, and you, you go and do it. It's that simple. You know, there's no there's no reason why anybody should fail it, other than they have an extremely bad day. You know, or you don't read the question, or you get flustered. If you've done enough preparation, and I mean, to reiterate what, what Kieran said, I mean, preparation like you know, you've got to do dry runs. I mean, obviously. I will say what the only difficult thing about the exam is is not the content, it's the fact that it's only seven hours long and you've quite a lot to do in seven hours. Um, and the way to make sure that you you know you get what needs to be done in seven hours is you've got to practice it. And you've got to do full dry runs, seven hour dry runs, and you've got to do two of them, three of them uh, with, with practice questions that you haven't seen before. And that's the way to do it. And you'll do, you won't get through the first one, you won't even get halfway through it. And you'll, you'll develop a, a, a style and you do three or four of them. But if you don't do dry runs, you won't pass it. That's for sure. But that's just exam preparation. I mean, that's not, you know, um, if you haven't got the required, if, if you haven't fulfilled some of these core objectives, you won't get it either, you know, because the questions won't mean anything to you. Maybe just to pick up on what Roger said as well, certainly in terms of um, when I was an employer, um, Roger said, oh, you know, ask somebody, can you go outside to see that? Ask somebody, can you have a look at that? Actually, employers love that. They don't see that as being a burden if you keep asking to do stuff. They love to see that sort of energy and enthusiasm. So I would definitely recommend if there's, if there's something you want to get into, just ask. Like in general, people are quite happy to, put, you know, I'm sure some of you guys are thinking, oh, they can't afford for me to be away there and I'm supposed to be working on this. I would take the opposite view. If I have somebody who's really keen, I'm really, you know, happy to invest that time in them. So. No, just as an education requirement is the level eight degree submissions. It is now what you the answer is yes at the moment and what you do is you need to check with the ISRP each year to make sure that the, your, your degree program is uh, on their list of the courses, you know. Uh, but generally speaking all the Irish degrees are all the four year honours degrees are uh, accredited. To see that they, at, at, the, at the educational base, like, you know, uh, but it's worth keeping an eye on. Uh, if you had a master's, well, master's not the. Do you have to go to exactly the same routine to get a master's? Well, it depends what your base degree is. If you have a level eight honors degree in engineering, or do you have, is it a cognitive degree, and then your master's in engineering? You know, basically, if you've any doubts at all, the, the, the education secretary on over and I struck me will ask that question quickly for you, you know. But is that the case that you, it's a cognitive degree plus a, an add-on master's in engineering? You should be okay, but it, you, you'd have to check out individually in that case probably, you know? uh, Is the exam changing in that you have to use your code? No, <laughs> the, exam, the, exam, the, exam never, the exam is almost independent of design codes. Okay. And you actually find that in, in the UK, people, people still use the old PS449, which is the old uh, direct stress design for steel. You can use whatever sign code you want in the exam. Hence, you see it's an international exam. If you have anywhere in the world, it is anywhere in the world, it's the most basic work. Yeah, that's, if you need a fellow, just contact any of the members of the committee and you can organize that. You know. They're still on the ground, but there's a few in a row in our operation. 
uh, maybe just pick up on that. Um, for all the students who are invited here, um, one of the reasons that I invited you is because I genuinely asked when I was an employer interviewing uh, for graduates, do you know how to become chartered? So you now know. Okay. But um, if you're not a student member, it's free. There we go, free. And I've even brought the application for it. And anyone who's in DIT, once you complete it, just drop it into my post box and I'll sign off the um, uh, employer type part. I've also got application forms for graduates. Um, if you're a graduate member, I have application forms here for that. Or if you want to be a graduate member. You're already a student member. You still have to apply to school once you graduate. Yeah. So you can take one um, so to get so many more questions, uh, thanks again for coming and thanks to our speakers again as well. Um, we're planning on having our next events next month, so it's a site visit to Grange Gorman because, as you all know, Dublin hasn't been very active in terms of construction work over the last few years, so a lot of us probably don't have site experience. Um, so I suppose if you're in the position that you're just starting out your work, you haven't been brought to site, you don't really know what to look for, what, what, to, what, what to expect, um, we're organising um, events that we hope to over the next <coughs> year, I guess. So our first one is the next one. And we might have another event before Christmas then. Then after Christmas then we have no direct plans uh, as such yet. Uh, we hope to have some project talks, ideally given by young engineers.